God is good. I told Pastor Ong, I said I would speak only on one condition, that if Cassandra went into labor, he would have to stand up and take over. So <laughs> he said he's prepared. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, what a blessing, isn't it, what God did for that church. And really, that church's existence kind of is a, a living example of what we're gonna talk about today, the providence of God, of how God is in everything and helping us with everything. Let's pray first. Father, we just thank you and praise you. Lord, if there's any time in the world, in the timeline of the universe that we need to hear this message, it's now. Lord, we just come against all the lies of the enemy that would tell us that you are not involved in our life and you have no control over what happens. We come against those lies and we once again want to emphasize, Lord, your greatness, your power, your majesty, and your love. We thank you and praise you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 45, verses 5 through 8 first. And it says, and now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. This is Joseph talking. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord to all of his house and ruler over all the land. And then in Romans 11, 36, it says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. In Colossians 1, 17, it says, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. As Pastor Ong mentioned, we're talking about the providence of God, and today specifically we're talking about the providence of God in transformation. And before we can talk about the providence of God in transformation, you may be wondering, what is the providence of God? Well, basically the providence means to supply to see to something, to take care of, to take care of, to see towards, to see to that, to make sure something, to be involved. And I actually like this definition by uh, Pastor Marvin Williams. It says, the continuing and often unseen activity of God, sustaining the world, providing for the needs of his people, and preparing for the completion of his purposes that's the key preparing for his purposes i think sometimes we think the providence of god is this god be involved in my life because that's what the providence of god is right be involved in my life but it's what i want and you get on board and help me with what i want lord i want this job so please god you get involved in my life and give me that job that i want that's not the providence of God. God's providence is he is involved in our life. From Genesis to Revelation, we see it in the word of God, that he is involved before something even happens. He leads, he directs, he guides. Are we going to submit to his will? Because, folks, as soon as we learn it's about him and not about us, the happier our life will be. <laughs> when we keep thinking it's about us, then we're going to be, it's like little kids. You know, when my kids were little, you know, toddlers and above, you know, they'd be, yeah, I want to do that. Well, it doesn't matter what you want. This is what mom and dad, because we know what's right. I know they say nowadays you're not supposed to say that, but hey, <laughs> I think the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> but, you know, and they'd still want it. No, I want to do this. I want to, if it was Katrina, I want to hold on to this knife. This two-edged sword. No, you cannot hold on to that. I don't care if you want it, but it's what I want. No, you can't have it. In the same way in our life, with the providence of God, sometimes we think we want something so much, but the Lord is like, no, you cannot have that thing. And I'm going to lead and direct you. I'm going to be part of your life. He is at work. 
He cares and he's working in and through our lives. Guess what? Even when the devil comes and tries to do something bad. Because you may say, well, if the providence of God, how come so much bad has happened in my life? That's not, <laughs> the providence of God is not that God makes your life like, you know, like a magical wand. Everything is beautiful. You can still go through bad things in your life, and God can still lead and direct you, guide you. And in fact, he can cause good things to come, like what we saw in Genesis with what Joseph said, right? You meant it for bad, but look, God put things in order. He created the world. He's very much involved in our lives. God, in his wisdom, cares and directs. So, you know, this actually comes against, before we f go further to talk about what the providence of God is in transformation, we have to make sure to say what it isn't. Number one, it's not chance. Oh, by chance, I just happened to go into that church. By chance, I just happened to bump into this person. No, the providence of God leads and directs our path. He orchestrates and he, he causes us to come across. That's what's called divine appointments, isn't it? You know, have you had any of those? I've had a lot of those divine. I can see hands going up everywhere where you know, oh, this could not have happened unless the Lord put it into place. That is, chance is not the providence of God. Another thing that is not the providence of God, which some people try to use the providence of God and the sovereignty of God as an excuse to believe in this is fatalism. Fate. Well, it's my fate. Well, you know, I have to suffer, so what to do? I'm just going to put up with it. Because after all, God's in control, and he, he's making me suffer, so I've just got to go through it. Nonsense. That is not from the word of God. All right, God positions us, he guides us, he leads us. But sometimes the enemy comes in and tries to thwart God's plans, and we don't just give in to what the enemy is doing, do we? We say, according to that thing that Marvin Williams said, it's for his purpose. So we say, Lord, is this for your purpose? No, it's not. Then kick the enemy out of our life and get back to what God is doing in our life. Don't get detoured. Don't get sidetracked. But even in those instances, when we do get detoured and we do get sidetracked, guess what? God will still find a way to bring us back on track. I know my second brother, Doug, he was detoured for 22 years. Drug, alcohol, everything. God had his hand on his life, and he was detoured for all that time. Did God say, well, you, you got off. I kept trying. I kept putting things in your path to get you back on, but you went your own way. You ended up in prison. You lost your family. You did this. So forget you. No. 22 years later, the Lord stopped him in his tracks, and he got back on track. And for the last 30 something years he's been serving the Lord putting God first pastoring a church doing what was needed to do God doesn't give up on his providence right it doesn't stop just because we think oh it's over there's no hope now right he has his plans and purposes which he will bring to fruitation so fate cannot be changed but with God, he does change things. Have you, think of examples right now in your mind of things that naturally is impossible, but God changed them. And that's your proof that the providence of God is not fate. Number one, the sun stood still. It's against all scientific and natural laws, right? The sun stood still. Number two, waters parted. Number three, ravens came down from heaven and fed people. Number four, mysterious manna from heaven came down and, and God caused it to start and stop at his command. Number five, lions' mouths were shut when they were so hungry they should have devoured Daniel in the lion's den, but they didn't. And number six, death was overcome with resurrection power. Friends, we have a great and mighty God that is not just way out there, that doesn't care about what we're going through. He is with us in what we're going through. He's chosen to be involved in our, he loves being involved in our life. But you know why this message is so important at this time? These three 
sermon series today and then next Sunday and the Sunday after that. Take your notebook, write it down, just drink it in. Because at this time, what is the enemy doing? He's trying to go around and whisper in everybody's ear, you're alone. God doesn't care about you. The world's it's falling apart. Everything's a big mess. There's no point going on. That's why we see the suicide rate increasing, don't we? But we don't need to believe that because we're children of the living God. And we know the providence of God means he loves us and he's working in our lives, specifically in our transformation. The first thing he does is he sent Jesus. Sending Jesus into our lives is proof of the providence of God. In Romans 5.8, it says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even before we know, knew Christ existed, God had sent him to die for us. All through the Old Testament, you'll see in the, in the prophets, you'll see what prophecies speaking about the coming of Jesus. It wasn't just chance. Oh, wow. I guess I need to send my son. That's not how it worked. God knew. He gave prophecies. King David, when he was writing his Psalms, even wrote Psalms prophetically about the coming of Jesus. It was laid out. That was the beginning of our transformation. We can't have transformation without Jesus, can we? And so Jesus alone is a prime example of the providence of God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's for all of us, friends. It's not just for a few of us. And I've heard people say, and I know I, I was studying some a little bit of doctrine the other day about this, that only if you're chosen. Let me tell you, we are all he died for all of us. And when you accept Christ, you are chosen. And so let me tell you, we need to get as many people saved because then they will all be chosen, right? Amen. He has died for all of us. There's nobody on the street that you can look at. Well, I don't need to witness to him because uh, in God's original plan, he's not chosen. I'm chosen, but he's not chosen. Go and jump in the lake. We're all chosen to come and know the true and living God. We're chosen to get to know. God did not create you and say, well, I created you, but I never want you to know, and you can end up in hell for all I care. That is not God. The providence of God is in his sovereignty. He loves each and every one of us. He loves what we are. He loves who we are. And he positions everything he can. Now, if we choose not to go in his flow, that's not up to him, is it? He does everything in his power to lead us and direct us in the transformation work. If we look at the second thing of the providence of God, we see providence before transformation. What do I mean by that? We can see the providence of God even before transformation begins. Even before you prayed the sinner's prayer, do you know God was working in your life? You say, are you sure? Well, let's look at some verses and see how sure I am. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared, what? Beforehand that we should walk in them. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you and appointed you a prophet to the nations. Wow. Psalm 139, verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Look at that. Ephesians 1, 4, even he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Wow. Isaiah 49, 5, and now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has become my strength. And now the Lord says, he who formed me, he already did it. He's already at work. 
And the last one is Galatians 1.15. It says, but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by grace. Well, I could just keep reading these verses because they, when, as I was reading them, I was just so encouraged. Lord, don't let the enemy come and try to lie to me and say that I don't have a plan or a purpose for my life. God is involved in our lives. Folks, even when we were born or before we were born, while we were yet in our mother's womb, God put a plan and a purpose and a promise into us. And do you understand that that's why the enemy fights so hard to kill that plan and purpose, to cause us to believe we don't have a purpose for being here, to cause us to believe there's no reason for us to keep continuing, to cause it to die even before it begins. That's why even during this time, that's the tactic that the enemy uses. There's no point for you to go on. Just give up. No, there is a point. There is a purpose, and we have to keep moving forward into that purpose, which God has already set before us. It's his purpose. It's his plan. The enemy hates the providence of God. <laughs> he wishes he could scrap it. He wished that God had just created all of us, and then he goes to his room and falls asleep. But that's not God. He's involved with us. And so what the enemy always keeps trying to do, you see it through scripture, you see it in your own life, he keeps trying, trying to throw curveballs, right? He keeps trying to disrupt what God is doing in your life. In Genesis chapter 50, verses 19 and 20, I like what Joseph says. He said, do not fear, for I am in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Wow, look at that. Even when the enemy tries to throw a curveball, he can't. Because God can lead and direct us in that time, in that place. Look at Paul. God positioned him, gave him the best education in the, in the scriptures, he lined him up. He wanted from the beginning that Paul would be a mouthpiece for him. But what did Paul do? Paul kept wanting to do his own thing. He tried to do it the religious way, the zealous way, the this way, the that way. He was fighting against God. And you said, are you sure? It only happened once, you know, the light came from heaven. Look at this verse in Acts. Acts 26, 14. Paul's talking. He said, when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in Hebrew language, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I looked that up. What is goads? It's when they're trying to like steer, steer and, and keep the cattle going a certain way and, and maneuvering or making whatever go a certain way. It's like, and Paul was fighting against that. God had been leading, directing, leading him. And Paul was like fighting against it. No, I'm going to do it my way. I think it's this way. It was good in his eyes, but it was not good, was it? Because it wasn't God's way. There again, we see that for transformation to happen, we have to be willing to submit to the providence of God and to the working of God in our lives. He's provided so much for us. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, his leading and his guiding, his word, but are we willing to submit to that? When God directs us this way and that way, are we willing or are we going to fight against what God's trying to do in our life? What are we going to do with the working of God? Because basically the providence of God is the divine working of God in our lives from the beginning and onward. In that transformation process, are we willing to allow him to mold us even when we go through bad times, even when we go through hard times, are we willing to say, Lord, how are you gonna be able to lead and guide me in this situation? What are you wanting me to learn through this situation? What do you need to teach me? I remember many, many years ago when I was in New Delhi and I was getting ready to start the church in New Delhi. And because we had just started a few life groups around the city, 
And New Delhi is not as, it was not in those days, it was not as easy to start a church as South India. It was a lot more difficult. So it would take me time and take the team that I had. It took us time to have these little life groups. So in the mornings, I would attend uh, another church that was in the city. In fact, just recently when um, Nisha, uh, not Nisha, sorry, Cassandra was going to Northwest University, I found out one of her professors was married to the daughter of the pastor of the church that I had attended there years ago. So what a small world is that, right? So one day when I was there on that Sunday morning, I was approached by a couple in the church and they were weeping and crying and telling me that their son, who was in his late teens, early 20s, he had really gone off track, gotten involved in the wrong crowd. They had, he had stolen a car, gone for a joy ride, been arrested. They somehow were able to talk the police out of arresting him and putting him in prison. But he continued in this lifestyle of being involved in drugs, alcohol, and those kind of things. And they knew that this would be a problem for him in life. I'm like, okay, how old must I have been at that time? 22 years old, 23? I'm like, hello, why are you coming and telling me this? <laughs> but they said, no, we feel you're, you're going to help him. I'm like, <laughs> I've never even met your son. I hardly know you guys. So I just told them, sorry, I'm very involved with the church planting. I'm sorry, I can't help. The next week when I went back again, they came, please, please. I'm like, I don't even know where to start. You know, it's like, I'm not sure. Maybe I had told a testimony about my brother, but at that time he was still in drugs and alcohol. So uh, my testimony is not much good. <laughs> so it, it turned out that the following week after that, they finally convinced me. So I said, okay, I'll do it. I will come, you know, whatever. I approached somebody who worked in Teen Challenge, and which is a specific ministry for drug rehabilitation. So I approached this gentleman in Teen Challenge and I said, would you mind when I go, would you come with me? He said, yes. That night I went to sleep. At three in the morning I was woken up with a vision, an open vision. Sometimes you can have a dream, but this was a vision. And all I saw in the vision was a man standing at the door, it was a young man standing at the door I didn't see anything. I didn't see bad things. I didn't see anything. All I saw was the man standing at the door, and all I could do was weep and cry. And it wasn't the kind of just, you know, this kind of weeping. It was like snot coming out of your nose, from your gut, you know, just heaving with weeping and crying and praying for whoever this individual was. I didn't know who it was. And, but I just knew I had to pray. And I, I don't know, it felt like an hour. I, I don't know if it was. It felt like a really long time. But until that burden lifted, I did not stop praying. And finally, poof, the burden lifted. And I knew, okay, whoever that was, Lord, you know, half the time I was praying in tongues because I said, I don't know who this is. So, but whoever it is, Lord, thank you. I'm going back to sleep. The next morning early, the Teen Challenge guy came. We went together in an auto rickshaw. We went down to this address we were given. We knocked at the door. A man answered the door. I said, I'm here to see Oscar. And he said, Oscar's not here. And I said, you're lying. And he said, what? He said, I told you, Oscar's not here. He's not available. I said, you're lying because you are Oscar. And he goes, how did you know? And then I told him about the vision because that was the man that I had seen in the vision. And he just broke down crying. And the teen challenge, I, I will be honest with you, I didn't say much else after that. I let the teen challenge guy do it because I didn't know much about what to say. The teen challenge guy talked to him, boo. And he was in tears. He accepted Christ. He was willing to go into the teen challenge program. We were just, when he got out of it, he started coming to the church. He was excited about God. And then I left India a little while after that. And I lost contact with him. But I always thought about it. I was like, I wonder, you know, because sometimes, you know, people with addiction, they'll get back into it. So it's like, oh, that was a great testimony. But Lord, I wonder, wonder whatever happened to him you know, in this transformation thing. But through that, I saw how God led and directed, how God brought someone from Singapore 
a 22-year-old girl, brought her to India, had this couple decide that they needed her to go and talk, woke her up at 3 in the morning with a vision. How? How does that work? That is the providence of God, the leading and directing. It was about three years later I was invited to Brunei to preach for a revival. And I don't know if you know anything about Brunei. It's, it's, you have to do everything undercover. You know, we had to hide and enter through back doors to have the service. It's like an underground service. But it was a mighty meeting. I mean, we were crammed in there, and people were just, the Lord was just moving. And in my sharing of the sermon, I felt led to give the example of Oscar, but I didn't mention his name. I just gave the example of him, and I was just saying, Wow, what God had done and what God can do for each of them, how God can, you know, just break through in their lives no matter what's happening. And after the sermon was over, I was standing outside, you know, just talking to some people, and an Indian lady walked up to me, and she said, were you talking about Oscar? And I was like, whoa, this three years later, we're in a totally different country. I mean, how did you know? So I asked her, I said, how did you know? She said, you mean, really, you don't know about him? And I said, no. She said, he has gone on to start rehab centers, Christian rehab centers all over North India. He has done so much to transform people's lives. And I tell you, I got the goosebumps because I was like, wow, a lot of times we don't get to hear the end of the story. But that was so wonderful. I said, Lord, you're so good. But that also showed me how God continued to be at work. God continued to do something. But you know what? Oscar had to yield to what God wanted. That day when we went, he could have said, I don't care who you are. I don't care what vision you have. Get out of my house. You know, but the Lord would have kept trying to come at him. But he had to yield. He had to be willing to submit. Thirdly, and finally, the providence of God is seen in continuing the transformation in our lives. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, oh, I love this. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I am sure of this. And that word, I am sure, means I am persuaded. I'm confident of this. That word, the, the root word comes from the word faith. Do you know that? It's to be persuaded of what is trustworthy. To be persuaded, the yielded believer, to be confident in God's work in our life. Wow. This demands obedience. It demands obedience. But we're confident. Lord, I know this work that you've started, you will continue it. Don't you want to entrust to the living God and believe and stop listening to the lies of the enemy that tell you this is all just mistakes happening and happen chance and, and because that leaves you feeling so insecure, doesn't it? And that's what the enemy wants. But if we can say, Lord, I know you are here. I may not feel like it all the time. I may not sense it all the time, but you are always here. And you are always leading and guiding and working in my life. Allow me to submit to you. Matthew 8, 27, and the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? In Psalm 89, 9, you rule the raging of the sea. When, it wa when the waves rise, you still them. Don't you want to entrust yourself to this God who can stop the seas? He can stop the sun. He can cause waves to go. He's not limited by what we do or what someone else does. He's not limited. And you may say, but you know, I've gone through this really hard thing. Well, look at what Isaiah says. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When, not if, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Look at that. Even when we go through the hard times, he's going to be with us. He's going to lead us. He's going to guide us. He's going to be there. But are we going to submit to him? Or are we going to try to escape? I was discussing this with Pastor yesterday. And he said the problem with so many of us is when he tries to walk with us through the rivers, we try to get a, 
inner tube. <laughs> we try to jump out of the water. We try to do conniptions. And then what's going to happen? We're going to have to go through that same water again. So, hey, let's just get it over with knowing that he's with us and he can bring us through. Amen? Amen? God leads and directs us. In Proverbs 16, 9, it says, The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And then Isaiah 25, 1. Oh, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. Plans formed already to work in our lives. And then finally, Philippians 2, 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work. That, that... Every verse is my favorite, but that one, I just love it. Because sometimes, to be honest, I don't have a will to keep doing it. Sometimes I say, I just want to go back to Singapore and be with my mom and be in a country I, re I, I recognize. Instead of being in a country I always feel out of place in, being in a country where I look like I may belong here, but I don't feel like I belong here. And so, God, you know, can you just let me do that? And he says, listen, I'm going to work in you to will, to want to be here, to want to stay here, because I've got a purpose for you to stay here. And I'm going to work in and through you. I'm going to be the one that does it for you. You know why we often get tired and we say, thank goodness I'm remembering this. On the way to church, I said to my husband, I hope I remember this because I didn't write it on my paper. <laughs> We say we get tired of living the Christian life. You know why? It's because we're trying to do it on our own. Can we just stop trying to do it on our own? And can we allow him to work in us, to will and work for him? When you start getting tired of living this Christian life, stop and say, God, forgive me for trying to do this on my own. Get tired of trying to forgive that person. Get tired of trying to walk through that thing. Say, Lord, I'm sorry, I've been trying to do this on my own. You help me. You will in me. You do the work in me because I cannot do it on my own. I need you to do it. I've been researching to write a story about my parents in Singapore. And in part of the research, I've been going through old letters of my dad and my mom way back from 1955, aerograms and old oil skin letters <laughs> and, and pouring over these letters to get a gist of you know what was going on in their life and I got up until 1956 and an amazing testimony there were so many amazing testimonies but this one just jumped out at me because it fits with the providence of God continuing in our transformation because I think some of us think we come forward we say okay God save me you know, I want to accept you as my savior. And then we think it just stops right there. And God just walks away and goes to the next person to get him saved or goes to the next. No, no. God, he wants to see us fully transformed. Everything broken off of us. There was this gentleman who was a priest. In Singapore, there's a festival. At that time, it's not practiced so much now, but it's called the Monkey God Festival. And during this festival, priests of certain Buddhist temples would come together, and the tunkies, there were people like mediums, they would go and they would put skewers through their mouth, like huge skewers through their mouth, and they'd cut their tongues, and they'd put that blood, and then I think those of you who have been in my mom's class, they'd give people that paper with the blood, and that's supposed to be your peace. That's supposed to be your help, right? And so he had come from this background. In fact, he was in charge of a few other people that would do this together with him. So he was the priest, but he wasn't the high priest, but he was like the second level priest. And one day he was walking around, he saw the sign outside the church, and he stopped there, and my mom started conversing with him in Mandarin. And she began to talk to him, and he became very interested. And so then he came back, and then he came back, and then one day he accepted Christ. And he was weeping and crying. He was so happy to have accepted Christ. And then he went back to the high priest at the temple, at the Siamese temple, and then he said to them, I have accepted Jesus, so I'm no longer going to be part of all this. And the, peop and the high priest said to him, if you 
choose to accept Jesus, you're going to go mad and you're going to lose your mind. I guarantee it. So he went back and he, he, was, he was shaken. And he told my parents. And they said to him, look, where do you live? And he said, I stay at the temple. They said, no, 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 you can't do that. Come and stay here at the church, which was basically their house. They were using the living room as the church. So he came to stay at the church. But during that evening meeting, halfway through the meeting, he started to like gyrate and something started happening. And so then they took him to another room and he began screaming. And for about two hours, they were praying over him. And he said, I see a hundred people. They're all biting me. They're all, and he was like literally losing his mind. And they begin to pray, pray, pray. And after two hours, it lifted. Then he went to sleep that night, but at two in the morning, he woke up again, again, tormenting, screaming, crying, convulsing. And they, they gathered in and they began to start praying over him. They started rebuking the demons. And they, he had all sorts of things. He said he saw animals sitting around him. He saw people coming against him, people shouting at him. And he said, oh, my mouth is bleeding. But it was actually so much saliva was coming out of his mouth. When they turned on the light, they said to him, look, look, it's just saliva. This went on for about three days, and they, another missionary family came over, and they started helping them to pray. He would get the peace. He would feel something leave, and then again, it would come back again. It was, it was like a fight. In fact, at that time, I have the telegram that my dad sent to America, because in those days, there was no text. <laughs> so he sent a telegram. He said, spiritual warfare, stop. <laughs> Devil at work, God will win, stop. <laughs> That's what his telegram said. <laughs> he said, pray, stop. <laughs> so as they were praying, they were fighting, they were praying. And on that third day, the fourth morning actually, this time, when he felt that peace, it just, he said, it's different. It's all done. I feel great. I feel wonderful. Now, he had said that the last three days, so they're a little bit cautious, you know. Is he going to start gyrating? He did a lot more things that I haven't explained to you. You'll read the book when it comes out. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> there he was. And in comes the Siamese high priest. The high priest. He storms into the into the chapel of the church and he stands in front of the man so have you gone mad yet have you lost your mind yet are you ready to come back to the temple and he looked at him calmly and he said no i'm full of peace and the man the man was normally a prideful man and stubborn but he got stunned and then he said, let me tell you about Jesus who has given me this peace. And he began to read from the Bible. And then he looked up and he said, those were the words of Jesus. And the high priest started shaking. And then he bolted out of the room. He became so afraid. And then a couple days later, the man walked outside and there was a neighbor lady. And she goes, are you an Indian or a Malay? He said, no, I'm a Thai. I'm Siamese. And she said, but aren't you one of those people that put the the skewer through your mouth. I've seen you. I've seen you at those festivals. And he said, no, I used to be one of those. I'm no longer one. But you're, you're part of that gang. No, I am not part of that gang. I belong to Jesus, he, he told the lady. And she goes, but what are you doing here? He said, I told you. That was me before. But I'm a new person now. I am changed. She said, but why? Why would you want to do that? And he began to tell her, about Jesus and how Jesus had changed his life. I'm telling you, God does not stop just the day we accept him, right? He is willing to walk us through, to fight us through whatever baggage we may bring in. And he gets rid of that, amen? He gets rid of it. He wants to do a work in us. But are we willing? Are we willing to submit to him and say, Lord, I'm willing? Let's close our eyes and bow our heads right now. I'll invite Pastor Ong to come and do the communion. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just want to thank you right now. Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, I just thank you for your word, oh God. I want every head bow and every eyes closed just for a few moments. I want you to just begin to take this time to seek the face of the Lord. God is working in your life 
Sometimes in our natural mind or our natural understanding, we may not see the hand of God. We may not see the work of the Lord. But I'm telling you today that God is working in us and through us. He's changing us. He's making us the man and woman of His will. The only thing we have to do is to submit, to surrender, to walk in obedience and not to give up in the Lord. Today, as your head is bowed, your eyes are closed, I want you to make that submission. I want you to give your life to Him, just like the song that we sang earlier. Lord, what can I say? What can I do, O oh God? But to give this heart, my heart to You, we are all in for Jesus today. As your head is bowed, your eyes are closed, I want you to make that declaration that prayer and say, God, I'm all in. I surrender all to you. Work in me and through me. Show me the things that you're doing. And in the midst of trouble, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of pandemic, in the midst of needs and all the things that's happening around us, in, all, in the midst of all those things, God, you are in it. You are in it and you are more than able to open new doors. You are more than able to create a door, to strengthen, to anoint, to, to make ways when there seems to be no ways. Hallelujah. Father, you are our hope, our deliverer, our salvation. Jesus, our Savior. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, speak to us right now. As you are praying right now and making that submission, that surrender to the Lord, we're going to sing this song as we, as we prepare our heart to partake the communion together. Let's sing. Let's worship Him as we prepare ourselves. Hallelujah.